So let us uh, start our first panel for today. It's on building and sustaining independent institutions. Um, I will call out our speakers for this session. Please do come up and take your place on the stage. Uh, sir, <laughs> I have a whole introduction planned for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll do it fast. <laughs> okay. So our first speaker is uh, Jaina Kothari. We request you to please come on stage. Uh, Jaina Kothari is a senior advocate and practices in the Supreme Court of India. She's also the co-founder and executive director of the Center of Law and Policy Research. Some of the landscape, landmark cases in which she has appeared in uh, include the constitutional challenge in the Supreme Court of India to the right of children to free and compulsory primary education act of 2009 and the case of national federation for the blind versus state of Karnataka we welcome you ma'am mr. Siddharth Vajarajan please join us on stage Siddharth Vajarajan is the founding editor of the wire he was earlier the editor of the Hindu and has also taught economics at the New York University and, and journalism at the University of California, Berkeley, besides working at the Times of India. <laughs> Welcome. Mr. Sham Menon. <laughs> uh, Professor Sham Menon is a distinguished practitioner of institutional development and renewal at higher, of higher education. He was the vice chancellor of the Dr. B. R. Ambedkar University, Delhi, from 2008 to 18, 2018. Under his leadership, AUD has earned distinction for its transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary programs. And finally, Mr. N.V. Varghese. Welcome, sir. Professor N.V. Varghese is the former vice chancellor of the National University of Educational Planning and Administration, New Delhi. He's also the founding director of the Center for Policy Research in Higher Education. He was at UNESCO IIEP in Paris for more than two decades. Welcome, sir. So this session will be convened by our very own Mr. M.S. Sriram, who is also a board member. Professor Sriram is a faculty member at the IIM Bangalore and is currently working as a chairperson for the Center for Public Policy. In addition to academic and consulting work, he has served at several committees set up by the government of India, RBI, and Amnabad. Welcome. I hand it over to you now, sir. The distinguished panel members to make an opening remark of uh, about uh, eight to ten minutes and then we can take it forward with questions. I'd sent some indicative questions uh, in advance, basically examining the relationship between independence and source of finance. So if, uh, if you could talk about that, that would be useful, but there are other things as well. Uh, let's start with uh, Siddharth. Uh, hi everybody, uh, thank you very much uh, to the CB CBPS for inviting me and congratulations on uh, the milestone that you have accomplished. Um, I'm especially grateful because um, the subject we're discussing today of creating independent ins institutions and finding ways to sustain them is one that's especially close to, uh, to my heart and to the heart of my colleagues at The Wire. Uh, as, you, as you may know, The Wire uh, is one of the few uh, non-profit, perhaps, uh, you know, the only mainstream or the only large non-profit uh, media platform in India today. Uh, we are now in our eighth year. And um, the reason people respect us uh, for the work we do and the reason why we have accomplished what we have is in large measure, I believe, due to the very deliberate choice that we made back in 2015 um, when it came to structuring the wire as, uh, as essentially a non-profit company registered under um, Section 8 of the uh, Companies Act. And we had before us various options. The conventional option uh, in starting a new media enterprise is, of course, to knock on the doors of uh, institutional investors, um, or if you, uh, if you lean that way, you could knock on the doors of government uh, and get their support. 
but uh, for obvious reasons, given the kind of work that we wanted to do, and given the fact that the need of creating the wire itself arose from our understanding uh, in the end of, by the end of 2014, or early 2015, that the media situation in India was getting very, very um, skewed, uh, and that there was, the room for critical coverage was shrinking. So we said, what India needs is independent, an independent media platform. And you cannot build an independent media platform if you are going to follow conventional, the conventional roots of creating uh, a media company. Uh, because, and I, I know this from my experience, especially at the Times of India where I worked for nine years, that you know, journalists may come in all shapes and sizes. Some are willing to compromise, some are not. Many are not. Uh, many editors also would much rather stand their ground in the face of pressure. But the weakest link in the Indian media is the proprietor, the owner, the investor. And they, they are a weak link because their commitment to uh, freedom of the press is, I would say, purely incidental to their commitment to running a business. To the extent to which speaking about and championing freedom of press related issues helps the business, they would be willing to do that. But when business interests come into conflict with uh, the requirements of media freedom, then they are more often than not willing to buckle. There are some exceptions. I would say the Hindu group, uh, which is a privately owned, it's a family owned newspaper. Um, but despite the size and the reach of the Hindu, uh, it remains a paper that uh, does not put business interests before um, editorial. And there are other examples, regional perhaps here and there. But you would be hard pressed in the world of television to find any example. And I dare say in um, you know, Hindi media, which is one of, the one of the language medias that I follow somewhat. Uh, you know, uh, you have Jan Morcha in Faizabad, and you have a few other stalwarts. Uh, but in general, the Hindi media also is prone, is prone to the same, the same difficulty uh, and the same kind of pressure. So for us, we said we will not create a media platform that's going to have an investor. And if, if not, then what's the, what's the alternative? And so for us, we, we bet on there being enough interest among the citizenry and reading public of India to want to sustain an independent media platform. Uh, it is a truism. Is it a mobile? It's not, it's not printing again. Okay. Uh, it is a truism that um, if readers want independent media, then they should be willing to pay for it. So for us, uh, the fact that the bulk of Indian media is not paid for directly by the reader or the viewer uh, is an important reason why Indian media is vulnerable to pressure. When the Times of India group, which is the largest newspaper group, uh, earns 95 to 98 percent of its revenue from advertising, and cover price brings in hardly two or three percent. In fact, the economics is so skewed for newspapers that once you reach a certain level of market penetration, as the Times of India has, say, in Delhi or Bombay, the more copies you sell, the more money you lose. Because you're selling the paper for five rupees, it costs you 25 rupees to print. And that marginal sale gets you no extra ad revenue, which is the bulk of your revenue. So there comes a point where newspapers actually say, <laughs> we, we want to keep circulation down, because the more we print, the more we lose. And obviously, in such a situation, it's the advertiser who calls the, shot, calls the shots, typically private companies, typically government. 
And then you have businesses, you have media companies that have secondary and tertiary business interests, which are often, which often depend on the government for clearances, for licenses, they depend on government goodwill. And most governments, even those who are really quite hostile to the press, even those who are not democratic, I'm talking worldwide, uh, would much prefer to lean on a media organization by tar targeting the non-media side of their businesses as a means of putting pressure than to actually target a newspaper or a TV channel. Just better optics. So when Danny Bhaskar came under pressure uh, and annoyed the government for its coverage of the pandemic in Uttar Pradesh, you know, they were the ones who broke the story of by visiting all the Shamshan Ghats along the river and adding up based on the sale of firewood and so on and so forth, and came up with a death toll that was much more than what the UP government was willing to admit. Uh, after two or three months had passed, of maybe six, seven months, you had the income tax people and the ED people knocking at the Denning Bhaskar for economic crimes allegedly committed by other branches of the company. So their power company, their coal mines, etc., etc. And that was an indirect form of putting pressure. So for us, we said the wire will be non-profit. We are not going to have other businesses where, the, where we need to depend on the government. And we are confident that the reader will pay. But you need, a, you need uh, we, were, we were conscious of the fact that to go from zero to a stage where you have enough content and enough of a reputation in the market that readers come to you and readers are, want, are willing to pay, you need some kind of a leg up, some kind of financial support for that interim period. And we were very, very fortunate that around the time that we, me and my colleagues, MK Venu and Siddharth Bhatia were discussing The Wire as a non-profit, there was a parallel conversation happening uh, among uh, uh, you know, some high net worth, well public spirited um, uh, you know, business people uh, Azim Premji, Rohini Nilakani, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, uh, who for a variety of reasons felt that they needed to uh, put money behind an ecosystem of independent media. They created a foundation called the Independent Public Spirited Media Foundation. And one year into our operations, we started in 2015, really on a zero to, on a shoestring budget. Everybody wrote free, nobody took a salary, uh, after a year, we managed to get uh, funding from the IPSMF in Bangalore, and their funding lasted about three and a half, four years, and helped us accomplish that critical mass, where by the time they left us in 2020, end of 2019, early 2020, uh, we had you know, more or less become self-sustaining. Today, we are in a situation where we get no large grants. We have an operating budget uh, I mean, we spend around 40 to 45 lakhs a month on everything, salaries, news gathering, rent, and so on. And uh, we raise from readers roughly uh, anywhere from 25 to 30 lakhs a month. And uh, online advertising from Google, so these are you know, automatic ads that Google or YouTube will put, brings us another eight to 10. And then we scrounge around knock on people's doors, because we're always short of two or three lakhs. So we will knock on people's doors closer to the end of the month and you know, somebody or the other will donate. You know, lawyer, lawyer here, professor there, uh, doctor, you know. I mean, some, some well-intentioned person. Uh, and we managed to hoover up you know, three or four lakhs uh, from such people so that we you know, balance our, uh, our books, as it were. And, and we are confident that we can sustain this model indefinitely uh, and even grow it slowly. But the challenge that we face, and that'll be the last thing I'll say, and I'm happy to give more details in Q&A, but the challenge that we face, and I was sharing this with uh, some friends over, over, over coffee just now, that how do you, like it's one thing to, so we are at a steady state of 40, 45 lakhs a month uh, and a certain level of output, which has given us enormous reach uh, we are one of the more well-recognized uh, media platforms, certainly the more well-respected media platforms in India. There's hardly any town I, I me or my colleagues uh, don't go to where we meet people at railway stations, at airports who say, look, we read the wire and you, know, you do great work, etc." So we, we, we've reached a certain stage of, of influence. But to go to the next stage requires 
uh, more output, uh, our video channel, uh, more languages. Uh, we have a very successful YouTube channel, more than four million subscribers. Um, and you know, we have important, uh, I mean, well-known personalities like uh, Arfa Khanam Sherwani or uh, Karan Thapar, who, who basically, um, you know, whose faces appear, uh, you know, who are, who are regular part of our video programming. But how do we take it to the next level? Uh, and um, so f the challenge that we are now grappling with, in fact, this is a project that me and my colleagues have taken up now, is that can we, uh, because th there aren't any big foundations on the horizon. So the scope for philanthropic, um, you know, donations sadly has, has vanished. Uh, IPSMF anyway was putting us on a limited time period. That's the, those are their rules. But there are very few large foundations that are, or corporates that are willing to, um, back critical media. And we've, we've come across lots of anecdotal evidence of companies, uh, you know, stories that we've heard of companies who say that, uh, you know, uh, we want to give, but we were told this, et cetera, et cetera, and you know. Uh, so the fact is that, so the challenge for us is how do we create a corpus of two to three crore that will allow us to engage in some expansion, fully confident that that expanded level of output in three years' time would pay for itself. But how do I bridge that uh, two to three year period? In other words, uh, in a situation where Indian corporates don't want to give or are too scared to give, and FCRA does not allow us to get funding from abroad. This is a challenge that we are grappling with, and I'd be very happy to hear any ideas or suggestions. Uh, as a nonprofit with tax exemption, there is also a constraint on the amount of commercial income we can earn. Otherwise, we could come up with various things to, you know, organize events, commercial events, but to maintain your income tax exemption status, commercial earnings cannot be more than 20% of your total revenue. So, so this is an, an additional constraint, uh, which, uh, you know, so, I, so engaging in commercial activities to raise some money is not an option for us, because then that would put us in violation of the 80-20 rule. Uh, so these are some of the challenges, but I would say, based on where we are today, um, you know, uh, I would highly recommend to other uh, media platforms to look at not necessarily going, being non-profit, but the Indian reader's capacity to pay and the willingness to pay should not be underestimated. And I would say that if you look at small new, uh, other in digital platforms, uh, News Laundry or uh, the News Minute, which is Bangalore-based, or Scroll, um, all of them have, you know, are, are generating significant amount of revenue in the form of subscriptions and contributions from readers. And uh, so I think that uh, something that the big newspapers shied away, like when I was at the Hindu, for example, uh, the uh, management was petrified of raising the cover price. That if we make it four f from three rupees to four rupees, then we will lose readership, etc. You know, they were unwilling to, to bet on readers, the readers' willingness to pay. Uh, but I think we've shown in digital media uh, that if you give good content, content that uh, you can't get anywhere else, then readers you know, are willing to pay. Perhaps not to the same level and with the same ease and uh, kind of uh, as, as, as readers in the West who are much more used to having a paywall. Uh, but uh, certainly, um, you know, if you give content and make it clear to readers that if you don't pay for it, this stuff can't survive, then I think it is possible for, um, for us to reach some level of sustainability in that manner. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lord Siddharth. Uh, Sham, uh, you've been in the academic world, so uh, there there is much more of state control when you're in the state university. Uh, how did you build uh, how did you build AUD uh, in spite of the state, or despite the state? Well, uh, th and thank you, Sajjan. <clears throat> AUD uh, was, of course, uh, was born in a very fortuitous kind of circumstances when, uh, when in Delhi, the Lieutenant Governor and the Chief Minister used to talk to each other. <laughs> and those days are gone. <laughs> so we were lucky. When, the, when both of them in unison asked me to uh, uh, set it up, uh, so that there was, um, in that sense, a guarantee from, uh, of cooperation between the, the, 
the union government and the state government. Um, because we were, we had to depend on both. Land, for instance, there's the union government which had to. So um, Jepal Reddy was equally, um, you know, uh, supportive of us as the as Mrs. Dikshit was, and so on. So anyway, uh, let me come uh, begin at the beginning. When we were when uh, when we were asked to when I was asked to set it up, I knew that it is not something which I can do myself. So we gathered together a a, a team of people who have worked together in uh, Delhi University, uh, Indira Gandhi National Open University, and Baroda University, and a few others. And uh, most of them, most of us have been, uh, you know, uh, how do you put it, uh, deeply d dissatisfied with the way uh, higher education has been going. Particularly those of us in Delhi University who were part of the administration, and we knew exactly the problems there have been. So we decided that there's an opportunity which doesn't come to many people to set, an, set up a new university. So we took it very seriously. And um, uh, all that we ensured that in this team there were people with authentic experience and confident, confident enough to experiment and make, mid, and, and mis, make mistakes and make mid-course mid corrections. And, and also the, the readiness to say no, readiness to dissent. Because the, if the, the, the team did not have people who could say no, uh, then I think it's, it's very scary for a person who is leading the team. Um, so um, we um, we were we had actually been quite bogged down by the uh, by the inertia and smugness in uh, in so-called better universities like Delhi University or, or even JNU for that matter. You know, the, there is a certain smugness which actually um, makes universities uh, incapable of. Uh, uh, moving further. The act and the statutes uh, have already been created while I was asked. I was given this act and statutes by the Lieutenant Governor. Um, and uh, uh, th that was unfortunate in the sense these were actually based on templates which we had actually uh, inherited from the colonial times. So th those are very, very inhibitive and th those have to be imaginatively reframed, but that couldn't be done because these are all uh, essentially um, you know, uh, done by cutting and pasting from other existing uh, acts and statutes. So, um, what, what we had to do was actually to find elbow spaces, even of working within these. Um, and we were, we knew that I, I was not J. Path Sardi or uh, uh, you know people like that. And so, I and uh, we were quite uh, aware of our own ordinariness. But together we thought that, uh, you know, even a few ordinary people can also do extraordinary stuff if you are uh, quite determined to do that. That's what we did, uh, tried to do. And it, the first five years was smooth. The next two, three years were also smooth. And um, uh, yeah. But anyway, the, the starting principle was that the university essentially is a, uh, is a uh, community self-governing community of scholars. That the assumption we, we took up and then we pursued because nothing else could have been. And if that's the case, the priority uh, was on attracting faculty. So the, the, if you do a time, time on task analysis of what I did for 10 years, I would say that the bulk of the time was actually in uh, searching for, selecting and retaining good faculty. I must have conducted something like 2,500 interviews uh, to select 250 faculty members. And all of them were actually 40 minutes, 50 minutes, one hour, one and a half hours interviews. So these were the serious stuff. So uh, people were thankful also. People used to, even those of them who did not get selected also used to write back and say that how they felt good having attended uh, 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 these interviews. So faculty selection was of course the, the major thing. And um, um, in, to identify the first 25 faculty was the most difficult. I had to find, select the first. Uh, so what I used to do is actually that uh, is go to JNU library, Tinmurti, and many other libraries and uh, look at journals. These are areas which I had have no training in. Uh, I'm basically a pedagogue. I work in uh, in education faculty, so I can't even say that I'm a full-fledged social scientist. So um, used to read international journals and um, you know look at browse through international journals, the cover pages particularly, and and find out the coordinates of Indian-sounding names and write to them. 
saying that do you have st students uh, in your uh, PhD scholars available or ready to come back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So 2008 was a good time to do that because meltdown and uh, you know the recession was happening in the West, and many social scientists were not getting any job; they were all coming back. So we really um, uh, took the maximum advantage, got the first 25, 30 people uh, when we appointed that they attracted the rest. So uh, my job was made much easier subsequently. Um, uh, then um, uh, one of the things which we learned quite early in life is this uh, public policy, public administration principle that the sponsoring organization expects the sponsored organizations to gradually become isomorphous to their own culture. So uh, in the, you know, Azim Premji University would look like an NGO and uh, uh, you know, Munjal University will look like a corporate uh, house. And most of the government universities would look like government. You know, so uh, their uh, the financial code and the way they conduct, the, the, the suspicion, mistrust, you know, the whole thing, the whole culture of mistrust on which the entire thing edifice is created. So um, uh, that is something which we needed to really uh, work against. Um, uh, and we also realized early in life that, uh, in our life, that uh, we, uh, the government expected us to behave like a government department. And the act and the statutes, uh, act and the statutes actually guarantee a lot of autonomy. But what really matters is actually the conditionalities, the three-page conditionalities which come along with that every tranche of grant aid that the government, uh, government releases to the university that comes with three pages of, uh, three or four pages of a list of conditionalities. So eventually that is what really matters, no matter what autonomy has mentioned in the act and the statutes. And another thing which we realized that it's not enough to be uh, pally with uh, Mrs. Dikshit and uh, Mr. Khanna, uh, it was also necessary to have a relationship with everybody right till the lower division clerk in the in the Delhi government because everybody can have the they, they have the power of stalling stopping uh, you know writing a note which nobody will be able to then write anything against uh, you know those of you who have been bureaucracy knows this very well I don't have to tell you um, <laughs> so um, the what we tried to create was actually uh, uh, a collegiality. Uh, so there was, uh, um, you know, one realized that, uh, 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 before that I must also say one thing. One thing we realized also with the dealing with the state is that there's a difference between bureaucratic state and political state. And the political state uh, and the higher bureaucratic state, particularly this in all India civil service people would behave in a certain manner. And they, they, are, but they are but uh, birds of passage. They would move from uh, Delhi to Andaman Nicobar to Goa and uh, various other places. Whereas the real staff who have, we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is the departmental staff in the directorate of higher education. And that's the toughest part. So, um, you know, we, I don't think we learned, uh, we were very successful in dealing with that. Um, uh, then the, we tried to make the maximum of the statutory bodies that were available, the Board of Studies and Academic Council. In fact, people used to be wary of it. But Academic Council meetings used to be like morning till evening. It was mostly reflective. The actual, actual Academic Council decisions were only very little. The, the statutes, I mean, the, the uh, statutory resolutions which they have to make at the end of the day is only very few. But the deliberations were, and we got, we were fortunate to get very good people to be on our boards. We had Madhav and uh, the, you know, the uh, National Law School founder, we had uh, Parishraman later from Tata Institute, we had Armeti Desai, uh, who was also in the Tata Institute of Social Science later, um, uh, UGC chairperson, all these people on our board, and that really elevated, uh, you know, the, the way, the, the, dis the discourse, discourses within the, uh, within the body. So people also started taking ourselves more seriously. People who came from other universities, they would see, no matter, although it's a new university, people come with their own uh, baggage. And it's mostly conditioned there by, um, by what is happening in other places. Um, see, but the financial, uh, the autonomy is what autonomy does, that we realized. And then, uh, you know, there's no point in just having paper autonomy. So, and uh, the, we also realized that the more we depend on the government funding, the less autonomous we are, in effect. Uh, so uh, in Delhi University, for instance, 80 to 90 percent of its OPEX, operational expenditure, um, uh, are on salary and pension scheme, pension. 
and very little is there available then to deploy for uh, quality and other kinds of stuff. So um, the, if what we arrived at, and this we had, for which we had, we had actually help from people like Pankaj Chandra, uh, you know, who was helping us, he was also on our board. Um, he, we arrived at a formula of 50%, not more than 50% dependence on granting aid from the government, and 20% uh, maximum ceiling uh, from student fees, and 30% uh, uh, from uh, other sources. Uh, the 20% student, may, it, it may appear to be low, but in comparison to JNU, which is only 0.59% contribution by student fees into the operational expenditure, or Delhi University, which was around 10% because of its size, um, uh, we were attempting to do 20%, which made the fee structure slightly higher, in fact, much higher. So we had to create a differential fee structure. So uh, differentiate between those who can afford to pay and those who can't. So, uh, and also the fees became um, uh, the, you know, calibrated on the base of the number of credits. So the, the credit-wise units were there, undergraduate and postgraduate and professional. Uh, credit-wise, we defined. And uh, uh, undergraduate credit will be 1,300 rupees per credit, and which is itself very high. And um, uh, in MBA, on the other end, will be about 3,000 rupees per credit, which is very high. So in, in, in the public system. But, but everybody, less than 600,000 rupees family income got uh, fee waivers. So uh, most, uh, many of them full fee waivers, some of them partial fee waivers. And uh, so there is a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, cross-subsidy which is happening. Plus we also created programs with uh, specific sponsorship, like Tata, Ford, uh, we created an infill program in development practice, which is in collaboration with Pradhan, which is, uh, uh, and we had this uh, field immersion in places like Chhattisgarh, and uh, um, it's a very, very intense, capital intense, uh, very operational, expenditure intense kind of a program, which we couldn't have done uh, without the help of Tata's. Uh, then um, uh, we created a, a body called the FAUD, the Friends of Ambedkar University, Delhi. With, uh, with, um, uh, in the United States under the U.S. Act. And uh, the Sarah Miller McCune, uh, the, the publisher, uh, co-founder of uh, uh, Sage, she donated the first $650,000 for that. And Vina Das was made the chair of the board of the, uh, and a few other American citizens. And we had nothing to do with it. It's only our name was there in their uh, society, but we had no control over them. But the idea was to keep a corpus of money and its proceeds available uh, in US dollars back in the United States so that our students can actually make use of it when they apply. They, so like applying for a bursary, they would apply to FAUD and uh, they would be awarded a bursary for travel and for uh, uh, some kind of conference attending and so on and so forth. And um, then another thing which we were attempting before when I was leaving was the AUD press. The, we wanted to start a university press and the first would have been uh, the, the volume in which your uh, article is there, Arunaji, uh, on Ambedkar's, uh, the, the 10 Ambedkar memorial lectures we put into one volume. Uh, we wanted to do, we have done it. That was the first publishing, publication of the AUD press, but unfortunately it didn't survive. Um, then we wanted to start a consultancy company under Section 8, by the way, uh, on social science research. So we, we thought that we had a pool of uh, people uh, basically available for, uh, you know, for extending their services, their expertise in social science research. So Metas will make you, we, are, we were the largest social science community, even larger than the School of Social Science in JNU. Uh, the entire university was a social science community for that. I think that was our, uh, our uh, strength. So these were the kinds of things in which we tried to ensure that uh, um, the, the, we, we could reach the target of not more than 50% of the operational expenditure um, being dependent on the government grants. Um, uh, by the way, all this uh, uh, were done, particularly, the, um, uh, I must also talk about the SMT. The, we created an informal, uh, uh, you know, governing, uh, internal governance board, internal management board, governance board, called the Skinny Management Team, which was not chaired by, uh, by the Vice Chancellor. It was chaired by Chandan, uh, the, as a senior, senior, most faculty, Chandan Mukherjee used to chair it. And uh, they meet every 15 days and uh, do the, the internal administrative coordination work, and also a lot of suggestions for uh, future planning and so on and so forth used to come from there. Um, all this was done essentially with the assumption that you know, no matter who is at the helm, I think things should go on. Did it happen? 
No, it did not happen. Uh, um, you know, what might be the reason? One has to understand. So one probably need to understand the uh, why a place like JNU is able to sort of uh, hold back and uh, push back a little bit. Uh, is it that 50 years that they have uh, more than Ambedkar? Or is it that something else? Is it the critical mass of people who are thinking in a certain direction? Or, uh, um, uh, or is, it a, is it a institutional memory, which actually uh, a shared institutional memory which should keep inspiring people? These are difficult times. And uh, I think um, you know, all of us feel despondent. So, but uh, I would tend to think that um, institutions uh, you know, uh, no, no, they have, have their ups and downs. But uh, as, uh, the, in the, in the memory of having uh, transited through a very exciting period would actually continue to inspire people in the institution. I met, I met a graduate from Ambedkar University, Delhi, here, right here. Um, he started, he's doing his PhD in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in IAS. Um, uh, so he was telling me uh, how nice his undergraduate days in uh, in Ambedkar Wars and how it is in, still continuing to inspire some of the teachers he remembered and so on. So I, I tend to think, I'm not romanticizing, I'm only t tending to think that um, um, the, the, as, as Adunaji said, the utopia is uh, in the horizon, but we must continue to walk. If we all become very despondent, then I think there's no uh, question of building any institution. So even if it is for finite periods of time, after all, uh, in this 10 years, uh, uh, Ambedkar must have produced something like uh, 3,000, 4,000 graduates, and they must have gone out with various places, and there must be, they must be making some kind of a trickle effect into what really uh, uh, made uh, those heady days of Ambedkar University Delhi. Thank you. Thank you. Since you are the mic to speak more. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. First, let me thank uh, the Center for Budgets and Policy Studies for inviting me and organizing this meeting, especially uh, Dr. Chotsana. Thank you very much. And I feel very comfortable after listening to Aruna Ji, because you know we feel that uh, I am at the right place. Because you know when we go to many meetings and inaugural addresses nowadays, especially in Delhi and many other states, we feel that we are at the wrong place and the participants are at the right place. I feel although the heart is to the left, the heart is to the right place in this audience and organization. So I am very happy about it. Friends, one thing that worries me after getting this letter from Dr. Josana was that, you know, how do we look at the public institutions and private institutions that have come up in the last 60 years in India? And how did they support and help policy making process or did not support policy making processes? I tried to make an analysis and try to divide the different stages of development of the institutional support for policy making in India. The first is the uh, setting up of the institutions in the 1950s. I'll come to a little bit of details given the 10 minutes time. And the second one is that using of the material that is produced to research that is carried out by these institutions for policy making, that is between around 65 to 75 or 80. And then you find that a commercialization or marketization of the knowledge production that has taken place and the growth of NGOs and how they have distorted the ongoing social streams of knowledge development. Then the lastly, how these institutions have survive in the post-truth era. I think we are in the post-truth era. And what research will do, what research can do, and what research cannot do. I think these are the four phases in which I try to see this. Then I will also add, since I come from a policy institute, I was in a policy institute, I will also add what NIPA did in terms of policy support as a footnote to some of the things that I am referring to. What you find is that India has the largest number of research institutions in any developing country. And if you see that 80% of the research institutions in South Asia is located in, the, in India. And what is also important to note is the fact that uh, these research institutions are not always funded by the external agencies. These were many of them public institutions created by the public body in India. And I was wondering why such a change has happened. I could identify three or four factors which are important for the establishment of large number of institutions in India. 
First one was that we adopted a democratic, a democracy as our reigning principle for uh, going ahead with that. If you look at the post-liberation history of many of the developing countries, you do not find that a democratic framework was accepted. At that point of time, 1950s, and even today it is true that India is having the lowest per capita income having a democratic society. So this is a very important, even at a very level, lower levels of poverty, we adopted a democratic framework. The second one was that we also adopted a public sector dominated framework. The third one is that we created what is called as a planning commission, which is very important for decision making processes and the support that is extended by the public institutions. But not only public, institutions in general, at that point of time. The fourth is very important point is that the political process was ready to accept the intellectual traditions and contributions made by the intellectuals of that time. I can name 10 people or 15 people who shaped the decision making process and policy making process in different aspects in India. But I don't, time does not permit, so I'm not getting into that. So let me say that in the 1950s, it was not only we created the largest number of bridges and dams for a different purpose, but also largest number of institutions were set up. I think among the institutions too, I feel, which played a very dominant and a contributory role is one is the National Council of Applied Economic Research. Such a institute did not exist in many places. And we created that, and that was established in 1956. And I think uh, many of the leaders at that moment of time played an important role. Why it is important is that it created, it is coming out of, no, normally institutions were established because of su supply driven factors. But in India, institutions were established because of a demand driven factor. Because of there is a plant development that is taking place. And the second institution is CSO, Central Statistical Organization. And these two institutions have really changed the way decision making process takes place. Since the, since the politicians of at that time were ready to listen to the individual, intellectual traditions and the analysis that are made by, empirical analysis that are made by these institutions, many of the decisions were empirical based and evidence based decision making was taking place because of this, you know, that is my first contention. The second period where we find is that in the late 60s and early 70s onwards, many of these institutions which were established became very vibrant, very dynamic, very active in producing research evidences, much more than what they could do in the 1960s. What is important is that in 1953, the planning commission created a committee called Research <coughs> Program Committee, uh, 1953. And I think this committee over a period of time, and the committee at that point of time was functioning based on the professors in the different universities. And it is this committee which later, in a sense, I may be overstripping my position if I say that, the ICSSR, which came into existence in 1969, which established 27 research institutions in the country, they came out of this 1953 small cell that was created in the planning commission. Or in other words, what I am trying to say is that since we adopted a plan to develop it, there was a demand that was created. And it will not be out of place to say that the, some of the people like either with uh, Ken Raj or with Mahalanobis and many others, and uh, many others who are responsible for creating the demand for data especially the second fire plan in 1956. The first plan was not based on that much database, although K and I was responsible for drafting chapters of it. It was not responsible, it was not based on the data because data were not available, so we created. So the demand came for that, you know. In the 70s and 80s, what we find is that we had a different type of arrangement whereby the, these institutions produced a large amount of empirical analysis and data. And what is important to notice is that the research shifted from the universities to the research institutions. It's very important to see that. Universities tried to rely most only on secondary sources of data and NSS sources of data and census data. And this has become too much nowadays we, as a result of the decline in the public funding for universities. And the research institutions, they try to create data through the empirical analysis, etc. So there is a shift in the decision making and the earlier tradition of what 1948 uh, Higher Education Commission mentioned about linking research and teaching 
could not take place because the research that was carried out was firstly not in the universities. Secondly, it was not related to the teaching that was taking place. The teaching and the curriculum remained more fossilized, whereas the research was more empirical based and more day-to-day -day based, you know, so there was a di diversion that was taking place. Say, for example, if you take the first education policy in India, that was based on Kothariga Mission Report, which was specifically created to analyze the education situation in India. If you take 1986 policy, it was not based on any commission report or such a detailed study. It was based on the challenges document which NEPA produced at that point of time. And that is one of the most widely discussed one. So the nature changed over a period of time. The locus of decision making and creating empirical evidence or evidence-based decision making substantially changed over a period of time. You know. Then comes the stage of uh, in the external agencies coming, funding we started, liberalization policy started, and two things that happened is that NGO sector, many NGOs, there was a multiplication of NGOs that were created in India, and many of them claimed it to be the strong researchers, although they did not have a research base. And what was the advantage? In many, many time, international agencies and funding agencies relied on them, and that was the first stage where the data produced by, and the information provided by, and the analysis created by, and the publications made by the public institutions started declining. And what is required is this, uh, what is to be produced by the NGOs. I'm not against the NGOs, that is not the point. I'm talking about a trend that is a dominant trend. So that was the way in which it is happening. And for the NGOs who are totally dependent on funding, and many a time it is not the national funding. When the total literacy campaigns were there, quite a possibility, there was a lot of possibilities of getting funding from the government. Otherwise, it's also dependent upon that, you know. This is another stage where I feel that market intervened, conclusions were given first, data was collected later, and report was written at the end. So, but the conclusions were given first. So that is a change in the total research dynamics that is taking place. The third stage, or the fourth stage, I will not have much time. The fourth stage I am talking about is that post-truth era. I think we should be very careful that we are all are living in the post-truth era, but I don't want to take many examples from India. So let me say that the la biggest war and highest amount of money was spent on Iraq war. What was the basis of Iraq war? Weapons of mass destruction were created by uh, Saddam Hussein. And 23 years have passed after that war. Nobody could find weapons of mass restriction. And nobody could be held responsible for killing more hundreds of American soldiers and thousands of Iraqis, not soldiers, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, you know. So that was a very clear-cut case where you find, you know. And many people in the United States even today believe that the election was stolen by Biden. It is not only in, the, in 2020 when the elections took place, even today, a good, I will not say majority, a good share of people still believe that. So we are believe, believe, living in a post-truth era. So for example, if I say that unemployment is very high, inflation is very high, agricultural distress is very high, I don't know whether I am nationalist or an anti-nationalist. I do not know whether I am telling the truth or research. So if I want to get money, what should I say? There is a change that has taken place. Previously, what funding agencies were trying to do is also trying to see that. So the public institutions are, are withdrawing from their initial tradition of providing reliable data-based analysis for decision making. I think that is the danger that is taking place. That is the danger that you find as a major problem for institutional independence. I will not use the word independence. I will use the word autonomy. Because, you know, the question is that how you can assert autonomy in this context is the biggest challenge without compromising on the financing. Because many institutions still rely heavily on financing from the government. So you cannot displease the government beyond a point. But at the same time, you cannot compromise on the conclusions that you are drawing. So that is the pro problem that we find. So today, if you are not producing evidences which are supportive of the policies that are made, it is not the other way around. Previously, we used to give the evidences to produce policies. But today, what we are saying is that we make the policies and we have to create supporting evidences to that. That is the dramatic change that is taking place. That is the place where independence or autonomy of the institutions are challenged today. And I think I end by saying that I was the vice chancellor and I was the founding director of the center. I don't believe in the question of this autonomy being 
manipulated by the government beyond a point. Autonomy, my understanding as the head of the institution, as the vice chancellor, is that, and you know, my institution is working closely with the government in all policy matters. And almost every day I had to attend meetings in the ministry, more <laughs> perhaps spending more time in the ministry and policy making. But I will say that autonomy is something not to be demanded, not to be granted. It is something that is to be asserted. It is the question of the leader's capacity to negotiate with the government for funding and assert autonomy. I think today the major challenge is this leadership is in question. That is because the way the leadership is selected is also a question. I was also a vice chancellor, so I also belong to that category. But I say that, so that is the place where when you talk about autonomy, when you talk about independence of institution, when we talk about how institutions play an important role in facilitating policy making, which is made more evidence-based, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm the last speaker on a fabulous panel. <laughs> uh, thank you, first of all, Dr. Jyotsna and others at CBPS for inviting me, and congratulations to CBPS on reaching this amazing milestone. Um, when we're talking of sustaining uh, independent institutions, and you know, we've had a wide range of different institutions, universities, uh, media houses, um, the at the center for law and policy research, we've had. Um, a different path and I'd like to kind of uh, just kind of give you all a brief outline of how we went about and what are some of the challenges facing us now. So the Center for Law and Policy Research is an NGO um, and this we set it up uh, about 14, 15 years ago. We're going to complete 15 years. We set it up because we felt at that time um, in late 2000, 2009 that we felt that there was a dearth of, um, there was a lack of research, research work done in the law, using the law because we came from a law background, the founders. We said uh, research in law universities was not being done, um, like you mentioned, on core issues that were of uh, uh, importance, importance in the area of social justice. Uh, secondly, wh uh, what was this, such research was not feeding policy initiatives, and thirdly, uh, the litigation, you know, strategic litigation was being done, was n were, didn't have a research base, um, and so we felt that we wanted to set up an institution that would marry these three arms um, together: uh, litigation, research, and policy work. And uh, it was with that aim that the Center for Law and Policy Research was set up um, to do cutting edge legal research, um, uh, to, to give this research input for policy uh, development and to do strategic litigation and public interest lawyering, which is not just public interest litigation, but really lawyering um, for the marginalized, um, which is based on our research and policy work. And uh, it was with that initiative that we set it up. Now, when we set this up, uh, uh, initially, uh, our model was not to take funding because, um, you know, the same, we, we had those initial debates uh, at that time was, uh, you know, would foreign funding, of course, we didn't even apply for FCRA and all of that, but we said, would funding or foreign funding uh, control our independence or autonomy? Would we, uh, would it, um, you know, come in the way of us taking up issues and working on issues that we wanted to? And uh, for the end of, and also there was um, no such ready funding available as well. So for a long time initially, I think for the first several years, we continued completely without funding, trying to offset our practice. Um, uh, some of us who started off, uh, the initial founders were practicing lawyers and academics. So we offset our practice in the traditional way that, that a lot of initial human rights lawyers had done to offset their uh, commercial practice and to support uh, pro bono work. Uh, so we initially did that by um, using our uh, uh, practice-related income to support a couple of researchers and support a couple of staff whom we could hire uh, and to be part of the center. And uh, it was only much later that 
we started applying for funding, both domestic and foreign funding. Uh, we uh, managed to get FCRA and, um, and then started larger projects, both on research and uh, policy and litigation. Um, and so, so, you know, while that went on, I think some of the uh, challenges midway through, uh, and I think now, you know, post-COVID, um, our themes had always been um, to, our core theme of uh, our organization was to make the Constitution work for everyone. And um, how do you make the Constitution work for everyone? Our focus areas were really looking at most vulnerable groups, um, Dalit Adivasi persons, persons with disabilities, um, uh, women, uh, women and girls, um, transgender and intersex persons. These were largely our focus areas. Um, and we did manage to get uh, support and foreign funding for that. Uh, but then, you know, when even pre-COVID and you know, during COVID, you realize that uh, the kind of um, issues that come up just expand and expand and expand, right? And how does an organization dealing with constitutional rights issues with limited capacity, how does it, uh, should we respond to some issues, emerging issues, or should we not respond? And, uh, and so those definitely were challenges uh, plaguing us, but yes, we, we took up a lot more, you know, uh, with COVID, we expanded our reach on the area of, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, issues we took up. And, uh, and this is amidst um, not just COVID, uh, which kind of expanded uh, the recognition of inequalities that we're seeing in our country, but also uh, the simultaneous kind of clamp down that human rights activists, human rights lawyers, uh, human rights defenders started facing. Um, and that um, also made us think, you know, we had, for the, la for the first seven, eight years, we had never thought of, like a, a, a thought never crossed our mind as to what issues we would take up to litigate um, or to uh, take up to write about and work on. And with um, uh, several human rights defenders and lawyers being arrested, being charged uh, in, under serious uh, uh, charges, um, I think a lot of legal groups had to, uh, of course the thought does cross your mind, can we take up this work? What, uh, will we be able to stay afloat? Will we, um, um, you know, uh, will we be arrested? I mean, you know, that is uh, really the thought that crossed, uh, men, you know, all our minds. And um, so now when we kind of look at some of our challenges now, uh, it's twofold, one is, uh, funding, how do we go forward with funding? Uh, we're seeing that for a lot of NGOs, uh, there's a real issue of if they're dependent on foreign funding, whether our uh, FCRA uh, clear, you know, per license will be renewed. Uh, many of them have lost their uh, FCRAs and are unable to get foreign funding. Um, and so that uh, is a question that uh, looms uh, over our heads, over our uh, institution when, you know, we, our uh, FCRA is due for renewal in a couple of years. And so are we going to uh, be able to be dependent on that? We've started uh, expanding our funding support to get domestic funds and domestic grants because we don't want to be dependent on uh, uh, foreign funds. But, you know, sources of domestic grants are very, are, is limited. Um, um, I think uh, Siddharth Vadrajan spoke about, uh, you know, uh, initiatives like getting the independent public spirited media, like a, a fund um, organized. And I, uh, we don't have that for rights-based work. Uh, we do have a few philanthropic uh, grant-making organizations, but I think we have to broaden that scope. Um, how do we um, get, we don't get corporate funding for rights-based work, for legal work. And um, so can, um, uh, you know, we think of initiating certain seed organizations um, like the media, like it's done in the media space to support human rights work, rights related work. Um, I think that is something definitely we need to think about. And uh, uh, secondly, while on the one hand we are uh, dealing, we're thinking of uh, ways to support funding so that we're able to sustain our team and our work. The second uh, challenge is how do we really stay independent or autonomous, uh, the way you spoke about, in our work? Uh, 
so that we are, uh, you know, um, uh, we are fearless in taking up the work that we want to take up. And in the last um, uh, recent times, we've worked on uh, really uh, 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 important issues. We've drafted an equality law, uh, an equality bill, uh, which um, seeks to uh, ensure non-discrimination for a wide range of prohibited groups uh, based on, you know, whether it's based on faith, uh, food, um, um, you know, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, caste, uh, political belief, etc. Of course, the law is it's just a bill and um, it, it, I mean, there's no real scope of it being passed at any time soon, but really to initiate conversations on an equality law. We've uh, worked with other groups to draft um, uh, an honor crimes prohibition law bill, which, uh, which we hope will be introduced at least by uh, uh, in parliament in the coming session. And uh, we've seen um, how caste related violence, interfaith uh, marriage related violence has escalated over the last three, four years. So uh, we've continued to do, uh, to work on many of these areas, uh, knowing fully well that uh, work, especially rights-based work on these areas, uh, is going to be contentious, is going to, um, uh, you know, uh, attract uh, uh, negative attention, but this is the work that we feel we have to do, and so the challenge also is to continue being able to do that work. And, um, and I think uh, despite these challenges, while we figure out uh, how we're able to sustain or get funding, um, I think the, uh, the silver lining is that we've been able to continue doing this work. Some of our work around intersectionality, around issues of uh, gender identity and caste, uh, we've managed to, with our litigation and research support uh, in Karnataka, uh, Karnataka government has introduced an amendment providing 1% reservation for transgender persons in government uh, employment which has never been done in the country uh, at any other place. So we're working really with uh, uh, multiply discriminated groups and activists to really um, ensure that their demands and voices are framed within the law and we have research support to push for such changes. And, um, and I think our um, way forward is that we want to be able to continue doing this work uh, we need funding to be able to do that, and we just have to find a way out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, as the mic comes, let me try and uh, use my okay. uh, decibel levels. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, these uh, very interesting observations, which uh, followed uh, uh, very nice. Uh, but not a very optimistic uh, talk by Aruna Rai. Um, you know, in one of the Kannada writers, uh, there was a joke that was doing around that, oh, this guy, he has a very bright future behind him. You know, when he, when he started off, he looked very promising, but, uh, you know, didn't live up to the, this thing. So I think we are living in a, not only a post-truth world, but a, a past glory uh, world, you know. Um, so, from the four presentations that I found, uh, I was trying to look at if there is a sort of overarching theme uh, on the relationship between funding and uh, um, independence or autonomy. Uh, so, f from Siddharth, one would surmise that the form of organization is important, that if you are a not-for-profit, uh, that in itself insulates you uh, from a whole lot of pressures that would challenge your independence. I mean, that's that's the sort of uh, uh, theme that I got. Uh, from Sham, it was much more about uh, building a culture of uh, autonomy. Uh, doesn't matter where the funding comes from. Even if you hobnob with the government, that's fine, but you need to build a culture of autonomy and you should uh, this thing. So it is a little bit of personalities. It'll, it's a little bit of team that you build and it's a little bit of thought process that you build on how you look at autonomy and uh, Professor Vergish uh, said autonomy is there for you to take, it, it is not given, it is not sought, uh, you just need to assert your autonomy uh, and does not matter what the context is. Uh, and uh, uh, with Joanna, uh, she said 
broadly, if you chase the cause, the money possibly will follow. Uh, and cause is what is important. So looks like there are four broad uh, approaches that each one of them have taken. But all these have been working in a certain context. And that is the past that we're talking about. That context is that there is a context of certain reasonableness and assurance that this is what the ecosystem is all about. You know, obviously, the ecosystem has never worked ideally. But you would say that, OK, if you are a good organization, it's likely that your FCRA will be granted. Uh, if you're maintaining your accounts well and you're doing you know, decent work and, uh, and so on. Similarly, I'm not sure if uh, Siddharth were to start all over again with the independent uh, spirited uh, media foundation still support you. Uh, if you started today and next year, would they put, put in money is a question that we need to ask. Is that context still uh, around? Uh, I guess that is something that is fundamentally changing and making us despondent that whatever were the reasonable assumptions that we had about the context is possibly not there. So I'll stop here. Uh, I have questions, but I will not ask them because I, it's better that the audience gets to ask the questions. Uh, I will uh, do a one-on-one -on -one with each of them over lunch. Uh, so any, any questions from the audience, uh, I'm happy to. We have another 15 minutes to go. Would that be a reasonable time? Yeah. Ramesh has the mic and he'll, uh, anybody who put your hand up, yeah. Can you identify yourself, please? My name is uh, Raghavendra Prasad. I'm an independent investigative journalist. Uh, my question is to Siddharth. So since I'm in the same uh, lines, uh, Siddharth, like uh, you just uh, highlighted one challenge, lack of public support while you started way back. Uh, independent institutions rely on public support to maintain their legitimacy and influence is what you mentioned. And uh, however, in some cases, the public may not understand the importance of these institutions or may not trust them due to lack of transparency or accountability, especially in an independent media organization like this. Can you help us understand how did WIRE tackle this? And you also pointed out that uh, Wire did not follow the conventional rules of forming an independent media organization. So what are the top three non-conventional process ideas which Wire uh, follow and how it was successful? Um, should I answer that? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please go. yeah um, look, I mean, the starting point was to be a non-profit, right? Uh, and even within that, uh, we chose a slightly more difficult path. Uh, in many states, it's far more easy to register yourself as a trust. And uh, there's, in fact, the governance requirements are much less uh, for trusts. And hence, they're also much more prone to abuse and more vulnerable to suspicion. And so we said, no, we're going to be non-profit. We're going to be... Uh, Section 8 company and go through all the disclosure requirements that that are required. Then we are very t another unconventional method we follow is that uh, we are very transparent with our uh, our, our finances. Uh, you will never find any other media person disclosing how much they spend and earn and what the sources of revenue are in any given month. Uh, the way I've unfolded f before you and we even have you know we put out on tweets a summary of because you know when our enemies began to spread rumors and all oh, this money coming from here and there and all kind of nonsense. So we put up a very simple pie chart with the full breakdown of the, of the first six years of funding, you know, which, uh, you know, what were the sources of, of revenue. So I think that kind of transparency, uh, and then, uh, you know, it goes a long way in, in building public trust and public support. Uh, we are one of the few organizations to have a, uh, a public editor or a reader's editor, in other words, an ombudsperson who uh, is meant to be uh, a conveyor belt for reader concerns, grievances, complaints, and also to go into them and adjudicate on them. And our, our commit, so our, our uh, ombudsperson is Pamela Philippos, who is a very senior journalist. And she's not a member of, she's not a staff member of the wire, so she's not, uh, we have no control over her. 
and we are obliged to publish what she, what she sends us. This is our commitment to the readers. And uh, today in the Indian media, I think Scroll and the Hindu and us, there's just three of us have this. Uh, and we've encouraged other media organizations to do that uh, as an added me measure of transparency, but you know, uh, there's a great deal of hesitation. So I think the more transparent you are uh, in your dealings with readers, I think the greater the likelihood that you will secure their trust and they will also then recognize the value of what you're doing and then come forward and support you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll direct my question to you and then you can decide where. Now, it seems to me that independence is crucial. It's extremely important. But perhaps this is not enough. We have to ask independence of what? It seems that we have been talking mostly about the independence from the or independence of the government or maybe the market. But also independence could be uh, thought a little little you know deeper than that uh, do i need do an organization needs independence from its own capriciousness and the ideological leanings do we need some positive anchor together with the independence which may be either reason or truth or say constitutional principles or something so it seems to me that when we are talking of independence alone and that the question hangs on independence from what, we also need something positive to anchor on to safeguard that. And I do believe that defining that positive first seems to be much more important. Uh, partly comment, partly asking your opinion on this different way of looking. Actually, I am drawing from the definition of um, rational autonomy where external pressures should be warded off, but at the same time, my own desires and capriciousness, et cetera, also I should have self-control in, in interest of truth and reason. Then only I could be called rationally autonomous. Actually, I'm drawing on that concept. Thank you. Ideally, I would have given this question to Siddharth because that seems to be ideal for Siddharth, but I'd request Sham to address it. No, I, I think constitution is the is a, is a framework. Uh, uh, as uh, Aruna said this morning, that I think to, when we were students, we thought that it's, it's very retrogressive, but now I, we realize that that's the last straw that we have to clutch onto. Um, so that is that that would be the guiding principle. I have no doubt about that in my mind. But so far as uh, um, uh, education is concerned, I mean higher education is concerned. I have one concern. Uh, the way we are going, uh, it, it's all, uh, the way we are going, it appears that I think we are getting into a period of uh, uh, what could be, uh, you know, similar to the Cultural Revolution of China in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, it's quite possible that I'm, 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 I'm seriously apprehensive that uh, there will be a kind of a uh, hiatus and a discontinuity in the tradition of scholarship. Um, and more important, I think there will be a discontinuity in the in the assembly line of scholars uh, in, in this country. See, on the one hand, I think uh, universities would no longer be the places where uh, um, knowledge primarily gets generated, particularly those knowledge which is critical and particularly engaging with uh, contemporary society. Uh, the, so it's quite likely that uh, that tradition of scholarship would move out of the university to something somewhere else. So we already see, uh, you know, I see uh, people like uh, Ramchandra Guha or uh, Madhavan Palat or all these people are working from outside the university, but then they are also engaged in scholarship of some kind, and then this particular thing can can be a trend um, because you can't stop, uh, you know, creativity of this kind uh, just by shutting up the university. But what is really, really problematic is, I think, the, the assembly line. See, uh, India has a, had, had an excellent generation of economists at some point because there was President's College. I mean, most of the leading economists of that time were all Tapas Majumdar students in, when they were in, back in uh, President's College. And, uh, and similarly, the best uh, undergraduate education in this country has created a whole assembly line of scholars. And that is 
getting affected by essentially because of one thing, this uh, vertical um, line of uh, you know uh, control and um, um, uh, regulation. Uh, this whole architecture of regulatory architecture that is being put in place at the moment that even it, it, it sort of it sort of dismantles even federalism and to the extent that every bit of it is uh, is to be accounted for for instance the state of Haryana has issued to all its uh, universities that there should be one single timetable for all universities in Haryana can you imagine so everything has to be known to be to declared and it has to go on and, and as though we are on a, on a, on a march together. Uh, so th this centralized uh, architecture of control and regulation is going to kill uh, uh, particularly undergraduation and liberal undergraduation. And I, I do think and I, I remember uh, in, in the, nine, in the eight, nine, 80s um, uh, in, the, in Palestine at that time the Palestinian uh, liberation, I mean, the state had not been established, this liberation struggle was going on. They, they started a university called Al-Quds uh, Open University. This was the university of the trenches. They were basically meant for act, uh, young kids, particularly boys, who never had a chance to go to college because they were involved in day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, their, their struggle. So Al-Quds op Open University had, had scholars participating from all over the world. And those days, just cyclostyling these material and making it available to them. And later, they can write an exam, and some of the uh, leading universities in Europe and others were ready to certify uh, for their performance. You know, I, I would tend to think that a, an informal way in which to ensure that there is a tradition of um, uh, you know, creating young scholars for critical thinking, critical engagement with society and knowledge pertaining to society is absolutely necessary. And that's something which now will slip out of established university system gradually, if the, if the trend is what we see at the moment. So that's what I would say. Long answer for short answer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arun. I'm a public finance researcher with Civic Data Lab. Um, uh, my question is how important is heterogeneity uh, of people who are part of the um, organizations in terms of maintaining independence? Um, heterogeneity of identity, uh, gender, class, caste, um, as well as ideology, economic, social, and political ideology. How much of that is important in uh, ensuring that an institution stays independent uh, over a period of time? And secondly, can independent institutions escape the vicious cycle of growth that capitalism puts us in that every year we need more research papers for people to do that work, uh, more grants, more revenue. Can can we escape that? Yeah, these are the two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will say that uh, I will not use the word heterogeneity. I will use the word diversity. One of the biggest challenges in Indian education, in research, and also in the institutions is the question of diversity. If you go back, many of the national universities and national institutions that were established, with the exception of very few, I can name some of them, have become regional institutions and regional universities. And the change that has taken place is in terms of the, from diversity, we are trying to homogenizing the institutions, and that has a lot of implications. It becomes regional, it becomes parochial in its attitude, and also it becomes parochial in its orientation towards research, etc. So this is a very dangerous trend. And if you look closely into the diversity issues, not only diversity in terms of the social uh, strata from which the students are coming, the, it is, I am not only talking about the student diversity, but also the teacher diversity, and also the diversity in terms of diversity of views. That is the place where Arunaji touched upon it, but I put it slightly differently. What is lacking in the universities today is what is called as a safe spaces for intellectual discussions. And if you look into the literature, you find that there used to be a tradition of safe spaces, but today there is no safe space. Because you are scared to make a point, because you do not know, in the name of the diversity of the views, the other person who is sitting, will be going and making complaint to the right places, right places in inverted commas, you know. So that will affect me adversely, you know. So that is the way that uh, discussions are sended. When I was talking about the post-truth era, 
why people are in the research uh, field and in the institutions are not ready to come up with uh, a bold position is also because of that. So that is one dimension. So I feel that diversity is important and diversity is necessary. Why? If you look into the knowledge production history, we have moved from mode one knowledge production to more, mode two knowledge production. And this is multidisciplinary. And one of the reasons and challenges that universities are facing today is the departmentalism could not progress beyond a point in the context of uh, multicultural, multidimensional, uh, and multidisciplinary research that has to take place, you know. So universities find it uh, very difficult to move towards a research where these type of changes are taking place from mode one to mode two, because universities are very good to, to carry out research in the mode one um, uh, more type of research, but when it comes to mode two types of knowledge production, universities perhaps are facing the challenge, you know. So that is the way. So I will say that diversity is very nice, very good. That is to be promoted. We should see that diversity is not a liability and it is an asset. So our research capacity will depend upon how we can turn this liability into an asset in terms of the diversity. That is a challenge that you face, even in the classrooms. Now, if you see that more than 60% or 70% of the new students who are coming to the higher education system, even at the undergraduate level, are first generation learners coming from the socially disadvantaged groups. But our system has not changed to address this change in the context of teaching learning that is taking place or research that is taking place. That's the biggest challenge because when you recruit a teacher, the teacher remains in the system for 30 years. The student is only for three years or four years, you know, maximum five years. So we have not have any mechanisms of orienting the teachers to adjust to the changing structure and the diversity of the students who are coming. And that is the biggest challenge in higher education today, you know. So what I always used to say that the problem that higher education system has is that Analysis, analysis paralysis. Today in the universities, especially undergraduate level, and even the postgraduate level in many places, there is nothing called analysis that is taking place. There is nothing called how to develop an argument. One of the reasons why the articles cannot be written and published is also because of the reason that there is no argument. Because that is the capacity that you develop, whether you do economics, sociology, chemistry, or physics, or any other idea. This is a central idea, a core skill that you have to develop, which can be developed. But the universities are failing to do that. And massification has substantially contributed to this process. And uh, we are not ready to change it. You know. So diversity is good, but that is to be handled very carefully. Am I audible? Yeah, 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 audible now. Uh, thank you for sharing your reflections as institution builders or leaders. My question to you is in the context of resilience. Um, how can institutions sustain good intentions and practices seeded by founders and institution builders like you um, so that the good governance practices you put into place or any generation of leaders puts into place um, can survive the onslaught of changing contexts? Um, I ask this specifically in the context of uh, Dr. Menon's reflections on AUD, um, and I'm sure these are some challenges we anticipate in institutions around the country and recognizing that there may be some young people in this room who go on to become second or third generation of institution builders or leaders. Is there any advice you might want to share in the context of uh, resilience overall? Uh, sorry, my name is Payaswini, and uh, I work in philanthropy. Thank you. Yeah. Let's take it or I, I can take it. Uh, I, 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 I mean, though it's not addressed to me, let, let me take the question. I mean, uh, I, I think we should take uh, the answer from uh, Aruna's uh, talk in the morning that you can create systems, uh, create systems in a way uh, that it is difficult to dismantle. It will be dismantled if somebody decides to dismantle but try and make it as difficult as uh, possible for uh, uh, us to dismantle. And part of it is organizational memory, as Sham uh, alluded, you know. Uh, organizational memory, uh, which 
constantly keeps reminding you, no, no, this is not what this was all about. This was about a debate. This was not about a decision. This is not about you know being high-handed and uh, so on. So I guess uh, uh, it it is much more about creating those systems which are hard to break. But you know, if one decides to break, uh, one decides to break. In fact, uh, I remember w one of my bosses closed down a program in an institution that I was working, and then set up a committee to say whether the decision was okay or not. I mean, that's also a consultative process, post-truth post consultative process. So, so uh, yeah, uh, we'll take one last question from Nikhil. Uh, OK, one last question from Nikhil, and there at the back, yeah. Uh, and and we, we'll really have to break, break for lunch. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, so very quickly. Uh, independent institutions, we all want them, we are desperate for them, we fight for them. What do you de how do you deal with their accountability? Yeah. Because as you make them independent or autonomous, actually you find them, we've had this with the Information Commission, we empowered them in fighting for the law. We gave them everything including Lal Bhatti. That's what they've held on to largely. So how do you make sure accountability, and even Siddharth was a very good uh, example of having one ombudsman, but it's not enough. And if independent institutions are to stand by people, how do you can make that connection of accountability, not to a funder, not to that uh, group that they are supposed to be a bulwark against, but for the people? I think, uh, th Joanna, would you like to take this uh, question from a, a perspective that you come from the legal fraternity? Um, no, I think it's really important, uh, and I'm glad you raised it, because um, internal institution accountability is something we don't often talk about, and uh, how do we, how do you do it? I think large organizations, uh, you know, media organizations can have an ombudsman. Uh, we're, we're seeing large corporations also having um, kind of boards and advise, you know, oversight boards and advisory boards or different kinds of bodies. Um, I think coming from uh, my field, like an NGO, you know, how do you have organize, you know, NGOs or other organizations have that, uh, perhaps have some kind of a, uh, an independent body or a board which to whom um, issues can be raised and they can hold uh, people leading the organization accountable for any practices which are kind of unethical or you know anything else. So I, but we have to, I think, build a culture where that is being done and that is demanded and expected. So it can't be like a stray organization having it. Um, and I think if we kind of try and build that culture where, you know, if you don't have such an institutional setup, then you're kind of the odd one out. So how do we kind of move towards something like that, that every organization should have something in place? Uh, in universities, Nikhil, uh, particularly the good, vibrant universities in their, uh, in the peak of their vibrance, it's actually the students who who um, are the uh, you know the conscience keepers of the university, and I've seen that in many instances. The teachers uh, have a class problem. You know, they are uh, the particularly university teachers. They are from the middle class, and they have all the all the insecurities, vulnerabilities, and self-absorption, which is characteristic of middle class. So the, they tend to buckle. And I have seen in several cases, and I can give instances, where uh, students have come forward and ensured that there is a, the teacher collective is more or less uh, keeping their objectives intact. Please go ahead, yeah. Uh, I'm a student of C and my something wrong with the mic yeah so my question is for Vergi sir and Menon sir both I mean whoever wishes to take this up um, like top businesses like Microsoft and Tata and Reliance are shifting their optics uh, towards research and policy so does this trend sort of uh, target the space in research and make the idea of research and pursuing it sort of tepid and lukewarm for independent and autonomous institutions thank you I think uh, one of the effects of corporatization of knowledge production is that the time spent on knowledge production 
has remained the same or increased in the universities, but the topics on which knowledge production takes place has substantially varied. I am talking this about based on a, a seven country experience studies done in Europe after the, uh, the corporatization process took place. That What is happening is that in many of these institutions, the research topic is decided by the funding agencies. I have mentioned it while making my presentation, and the corporate sector. Now, previously, what used to happen is that Microsoft and many other institutions, IBM, etc., they had their own in-house research. Now, what is happening is that they are offloading this uh, in-house research to public institutions, not at their cost, at the cost of the public institution. They'll give money for a fund, for a project, but the staff time that is spent and the administrative time that is spent is the public money. So it is a privatization of knowledge production for corporatization of profit at the cost of the public money. You know, this is a change that is taking place in many cases. So whether it is IBM or any other institution, Microsoft, etc., coming to the universities, that is a good thing. I will not say it is a bad thing. But what is happening is that you, the universities are at their at their mercy to get funds. So it is the decline of the public funds that is making, that is derailing the whole process of knowledge production and the way in which knowledge production takes place, you know. That is the way that it is happening. This is happening not only in the knowledge production, but also in the knowledge transactions. When you talk about MOOCs and many other new forms of learning that is taking place, it's actually commercialization. So it has a lot, we have less understood the implications of corporatization of higher education sector, not only in terms of provision of services, but also in the process of knowledge production. Why? Because this corporatization knowledge production is more dangerous than in knowledge transaction. Because it is the same knowledge that is produced by these means which will become the source for the decision making for others. So it is not confined to the company. Because the earlier, the in-house knowledge production was used only for the company. So even if it is used or misused, it was limited in its uh, sphere, limited in its influence. But this is getting wider acceptance and it is more dangerous, that is what I feel.